So I was having a drink with my friend Louise the other day. Louise is one of a new hobbyist into the RPG world. Uh, she came into it because of sort of the celebrity culture and because she knew geeks that, that um, played d and and she got interested and so she came in and she said, look, I want to try this. Loved it, saw it, DMing now, running con, con games, the last two or three years, huge. And she's not the only person like that. She's not the only person I've met like that. These are people who are now experiencing um, RPGs for the first time and are very, very excited by it, are very, very engaged with it, uh, finding it meaningful and useful and fun and creative. But this new audience of especially young people might not necessarily like how RPGs have existed for the last 40 years because the one thing I'm learning from these new new school conversations over and over, and it's that narratives of comradeship, of friendship, of uh, making peace, of understanding one another are to be preferenced very strongly over narratives of violence and conflict and war. Now, I'm very old school. I always tend to think of RPGs in terms of action and adventure and excitement and violence is a part of that. But, well, the world is changing. The audience is new and I would like to engage with that, that newer audience. I would like to play different kinds of games and I've played over the last 20, 30 years. It's more than that. And um, I would like to, um, to, to engage and see what they can teach me about my hobby that I like and I've enjoyed and show it to me with fresh eyes. So today we are going to talk a little bit about doing campaigns that are specific and less confrontational and uh, more to do with um, the communal experiences of RPGs than the conflicting experiences of RPGs. Welcome. Hello. We're going to do that now. Here we go. So before we go too far on, we should probably just say that D&D might not be the best place to really bring in a game that's strongly about emotions and narratives and uh, cooperation and friendship and de-emphasizes violence and conflict just because you roll up a D&D character and all you really know about the character at the beginning is these are the ways I have to hurt things and to fight things. So the good news is there are lots and lots of games that have existed for quite some time that will de-emphasize this um, combat and will emphasize ties to other characters and drama and, and emotional conflict. Fate, which is a narrative game, and particularly a, a game of fate called Monster Hearts, which is about ties to other players, ties to your community, your fears, your doubts. Even if you still want to use D&D, have a look at a fate game, have a look at a game like Monster Hearts Leverage, which was a TV show. It's got a lot of mechanics for how to um, do a story um, over a, a strong narrative. Blades in the Dark is very, very similar. It, it emphasizes that when you are, have completed the campaign session, you have much more of a story and there's like flashbacks and controlling the narrative and mechanics like that. Pendragon, which is very, the famous Arthurian um, mythology and Arthurian um, chivalry of um, RPG, it has a very, very famous campaign called... <sighs> and this is uh, really going to blow your socks off with its originality, the Great Pendragon Campaign. It's a few years or a lifetime maybe even uh, for a group of knights. And while there's war and things, the actual sort of getting into combat and blood and guts is, is de-emphasizing. If you don't want to get into that, you don't have to get into it. But if players do, they can. So that's pretty good. Call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu, while always still about investigating and hunting things down and solving the problems... You can't really fight the monsters in Call of Cthulhu. They're just outside the context of I shoot you. So using COC for some adventure ideas, because uh, you've got to cooperate with your with your PCs. You've got to cooperate with the party in COC or it's just pointless. So yeah, so there's some, some RPGs that you might want to have a think about, that you might want to get inspired by, even if you do want to run a D&D campaign. There's good ideas out there. Have a think about it. And now we'll have a think about what 
you can do in D&D &D that isn't fighting. Alright, so what are the things that you do in a RPG when you don't want to do violence and you do, would want to de-emphasize conflict? Well, I think there's a few things. Uh, exploring is a really, really big part of the game from the old school, like um, hex crawls and things like that. So you can still ex um, experiment with those, still get some old, old school games and have a think about how they used to run, run things. Uh, just grab a copy online and they're available for very, very cheap. Um, just any any of the old school um, retro clones, or I think you can even get the original first edition and first AD and Ds um, from the Wizard side and stuff. So, I just have a look and see how they handled explorations and things like that. Making money, um, stealing rather than fighting, used to be a big part of the actual dungeon crawl experience. Again, that's a bit old school, so you can emphasize that. But the idea is that you would get experience points from gold because it was all about getting the gold rather than just stabbing the monster and um, tactics of avoiding violence were considered just as valid as violence and it's just sort of in the recent years that that's changed. Uh, interacting with monsters and interacting with strange NPCs. Easy done. Uh, you don't always have to fight monsters, especially intelligent monsters, but even you know creatures like monstrosities, even with they've got a, a, an evil um, alignment, I don't think that necessarily means that they are always malevolent or psychotic or whatever, I just think that means that they're, you know, a feral dog is still a dog, it's still going to bite you, but you can possibly train it. And of course the other is interpersonal drama, which I think a lot of us are here for, I know I am, I love it. So keeping those things in mind, we're just going to riff on some campaign ideas and hopefully you will find these useful to think about if you have a group that wants to explore less um, violent areas of the game. First up, mercantilism, trading, merchants, making cash, but not out of uh, stealing, out of trade. I've actually always really, really wanted to do a, a game just like this, a game that emphasizes specifically trading and money and wealth and dealing with communities and going to them and finding what they have that you can buy and then later on sell and how to build up uh, riches in a, in a mercantile empire. I've never really been able to to attract a, a crew who wanted to do that, and it's a shame because I think it would be great. So um, it's that simple. You, when you're a DM, uh, you start them off with a rusty old wagon filled with turnips and a few you know, rusty short swords. Pretty easy. From there, you, this is the thing is as a DM, you'll have to do a fair amount of work because you're going to have to give them lots of information and lots of ways to get information. So you might want to hear about, you know, I, I hear that there's a distant market and a rare blue rose. If I could get the blue roses and bring them back, we'd all have money. If I hear that there, oh no, there is a plague. Oh, wait, 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 wait. The, the medicine that cures the plague is made from this fungus so I can go and buy the fungus and, and stick, have it all and capitalize that market. Wait, that's a bit immoral, isn't it? Oh, who cares? We're making money. Or do you want to explore that moral dimension to, to trading and buying? So that you um, you spy on people. You send a bard in. One of your characters is a bard who's hanging out in town and he finds out that the local countess prefers to wear blue dresses, which means that blue will become very, very popular in the next few years. So you need to run out and buy blue dye, you need to run out and buy blue threads, you need to buy blue silks, blue wool, all the rest of it. So you do that and you can, you know, corner that market. But then what happens when you run into rival cartels? Say that you've made a, an arrangement with a local griffin herd or you've even just stolen a bunch of griffins and now you milk them and you sell the griffin milk. All right, that's pretty good. It's a nice scam. Griffin milk uh, makes you grow up big and strong, nice and healthy, but then someone steals all your griffins and yet somehow griffin milk is still entering the territory. Who is that? Who are they? You're going to have to deal with them. What if you can't go to the police because griffin milk is not exactly legal? So you have to deal with them, but you can't fight them. You don't want to fight them. So you're going to have to negotiate with them. Maybe you then go and undercut your rivals by getting hippogriff milk. How are they going to respond? Uh, maybe you're going to invent things to sell by yourself. Uh, you could be inventing new magical items. You could be inventing new spells. 
You will need to keep that safe from industrial spies. You will need to um, find ways to release that onto the market. You will need to find ways to find markets to buy that. Because you say that if you've invented some kind of um, super weapon, are the local knights going to be happy that they are maybe getting um, made redundant as battlefield um, units? Maybe you then, it, it's all going well, so you're hiring staff. It's, it's going okay because you are going to need guards. You need salesmen. You're probably going to want to have someone do your accounting for you. Are they all trustworthy? Are any of them spies from rivals? Do you have a good relationship with the nobility who might not have as much money as you, but nevertheless have legal prerogatives? Do they hate you? Do they like you? Do you want to enter the nobility? Do they need your money? Are you just a horrible nouveau riche capitalist scumbag? And dealing with monsters becomes a lot more interesting as well, because especially with intelligent monsters, you're not going to be interested in fighting them. You're going to be interested in making money with and off them. So a normal adventurer hears about a dragon burning a crop and stealing uh, children to eat. And they go, right, we must kill that dragon. And maybe we can retrieve its gold at the same time. But a mercantile party might just go, hi, dragon. I'm waving my white flag because I have a, a job offer for you with like really, really generous day rates in which you will become an advisor to my business organization and you will make money out of using your dragon fire to help us with our blacksmithing operations. Free money for you, for doing well, money for you for doing very, very little. And everyone will know that you are working with us and are safe. So you will probably get less PCs from other campaigns trying to kill you. So any DM that's willing to spend some time learning a little bit about economic history, learning a little bit how trade worked in the time period that is inspiring your campaign, you really, really can come up with a campaign that's quite interesting that provides new challenges and it gives players new ways to look at their character class as well. What's an artificer look like when you're trying to sell these magical items? What's a priest look like when you can make a bunch of money out of your healing spells? Is that what the god would like? Is that appropriate? Uh, mages, of course, wizards, warlocks, sorcerers, all of them, they've all got loads and loads of ways to make money. Barbarians live out in the wild. They know all sorts of things. Rangers are always finding weird hidden locations and you know, unicorns to turn into dog food. So, mercantilism. Have a think about it. Be fun. Number two, exploring. So, yeah, make a, make a PC party that's all cartographers. Perhaps they are exploring a whole new land and rather than sending in the army, they are private contractors or simply a part of the king's mapping expeditions. Perhaps that your kingdom, your world is coming out of a, of a dark age and the, the treasures of the ancient land are lost and now you need to find lost civilizations, lost nations, lost capital cities, lost magical research centers, lost temples, lost anything. You need to understand what is going on with the monsters, with the what happened to the elves, your staunchest allies. Where are the dwarves? Where are the halflings? Where are the dragons? Where's anything? And so in a world in which uh, you need to reconnect rather than fight what's out there. You, you need to create, or maybe simply just eventually fighting will come, but that's not your job. Your job is just to give the fighters uh, an understanding of what's in the world now. I think that instead of looking to create combat encounters, you're really, really going to want to do a lot of thrilling adventure set pieces and a lot of uh, environmental hazards. You're going to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. You're going to watch shows like Relic Hunter. You're going to play Tomb Raider. You're going to play a lot of those games in which, uh, video games in which solving problems is important about understanding which blocks go where, moving the lights to open up the doors to you know, all that sort of stuff. You know how it goes. I'm sure you played video games once or twice in the past. And you need to emphasize cooperative puzzles as well because you want all your players to have things to do. Um, probably want to get some riddles in there because riddles are always useful for groups to do even though they are the worst and I hate them but anyway doesn't matter you want to give different character classes a lot of sort of specific input into the game priests will understand clerics will understand this is the ancient order of Sinestra the dragon lady uh, rangers and barbarians will always have lots of stuff to do because they um, live out in that sort of environment anyway. 
Wizards, warlocks, sorcerers, they always have law skills. Rogues are always great adventurers and great explorers and great detrappers and things like that. Um, fighters. Fighters are always going to be a problem in a game like this. Um, we'll get to that later on. All right, now we're into interpersonal drama. Uh, campaigns that will be specifically about how your players react to one another and to PCs and to NPCs around them. Ambassadors. You are the diplomatic corps. You represent your kingdom or country and you go to a foreign kingdom or country and your job is to represent the interests of your noble class or your prime minister or whatever. First of all, you have to stick together. Your PCs are hired to do a job. There will probably be a hierarchy within the actual uh, PC party itself. You might want to work with the players to see who's comfortable. I'm the boss. I'm the minister. I'm the, the person in charge of money. I'm the person in charge of intelligence. I'm the person in charge of hospitality. And then you need to have a look and do some research on what actual ambassadors and diplomats do in their day to day life. You might need to get a trade deal through. The king writes you a letter. I need to sell 10,000 swords that I have. Try and sell them to this market. Try and sell them to this um, baron of this new kingdom that you're working in. Perhaps the kingdom that you're in is at war and that's bad for you. Or perhaps it's great for you and you need to keep that war going on. Um, you have, will have to run spies. You will have to understand what's going on, what's being hidden from you in your host nation. You will have to flip both uh, citizens of your host nation and expats from your country living in your host nation, you might run into troubles very easily. You might break local taboos. Uh, you might accidentally insult someone or misunderstand a religious uh, festival or anything like that, which could have actual supernatural consequences because, you know, crossing the wrong way in our world might be a little bit... Doing it in a fantasy world might be now the gods shoot you in the face with a lightning bolt for a thousand years and never ever stop. <sighs> so, there's a civil war going on. Do you take two sides in that civil war? Do you play both sides off against each other? Is that moral? Is there money to be made for you personally by backing one of these sides? Will you work for peace? Even though it might actually be good for your king if this country sort of destroys itself. Now do all your party members, do all your PCs have the same politics? Do they have the same goals? Do they believe the same things? Not everyone is loyal, is it as loyal to a king as other people are? And especially if you're, if you're the nation that you represent is, is um, politically divided, say you don't have a king, say you have a political party that's in charge of your own nation and the PCs belong to different factions of the, the political spectrum, they're going to disagree. And what happens when things get really supernatural? What happens when the god of your country and the god of your host country, they begin to fight? Then you're really in trouble because not only are you going to have to somehow keep lines of communications open on the mortal plane, you might be dragooned into some sort of fight between angels. The thing for DMs to do here is to just read a bit. Look up some famous diplomatic incidences and how diplomats have worked. Diplomats write books, write loads and loads of books. There's a few behind me. If you're really interested, I'll, I'll name some below. But if you have a look at the Cutter incident of a few years ago, of about, I think, 2017, um, diplomatic ties between Saudi and Qatar went very, very bad very, very quickly, and it was on diplomats to take care of, of that. It was a legit crisis. And then there are other actually quite, you know, colorful and interesting crises to, to draw from. There's the affair of the blue diamond, uh, the cocktail wars, which were all about how you can invite the wrong person to the party. And suddenly relationships between your two countries are in a lot of trouble. Then you get slightly more um, topical events like the famous, the affair of the dancing llamas which was about Tibetans began to feel that the way that they were represented in foreign cultures was quite disrespectful. This is before the Chinese came. So, Affair of the Poison Necklace. There's loads and loads of famous things that you could build adventure ideas about. Um, you have NPCs coming in from your home country to destabilize your region. You could be told, okay, the way that you're doing things is wrong. 
because you're being too fair to these people and you've begun to like the host nation that you live in. Hmm, that's bad. So, you know, divided loyalties. Have a think about it. There was a Mitchell and Webb my little um, three-part miniseries a few years ago called Ambassadors, which was quite cool. Have a look at that. Just a, a good intro into how these things work. Some rapid-fire ideas now. You might need to build something. You might be in charge of a huge building project, a huge supernatural location like a temple to the great god or there are Colossus of Rhodes sort of thing or reclaiming a, a lost bastion of the ancient world. You're going to have to deal with guilds, like the actual working people's associations. You're going to have to deal with labor. You're going to have to deal with management. Perhaps if you are doing a very, very religious uh, location that you're reclaiming or building, you're going to have popes and priests, and they're going to disagree with the noble class who are probably going to be funding the entire thing. And the nobility are going to want to, you know, not be, well, we're not too sure that we want to give the religious priests too much power. Hmm. And other priests are going, this is really important because if you give us this, religion will become the most important part of our society now. What do your players think about that? Where do they stand on this divide, nobility versus church? Some of the pieces will just be artisans. Their main job will be to build beautiful things. Allow them to tell you what they want to build. It will in, they will invest so much more if they come to you and say, I want to build a beautiful, beautiful sculpture of uh, an angel. Let them. If they come to you and say, I want to build a beautiful, beautiful statue of a squid that's clearly drunken in a fight, let them. Just, just let them. They will feel invested in it. Um, you could be exploring the, the local area and maybe you find like deep dogweed caverns to combine a bit of exploring. Perhaps you get a little bit Tower of Babel and, and you make the beautiful cathedral and an angel comes down and goes, what have you done? What have you done? You fools, you don't understand. Maybe it's all gone terribly, terribly wrong and the secret architect behind all this has been worshipping the devil all along so that when the, the, you begin to realise that the beautiful, beautiful cathedral that you have built is in fact somehow resonating with the forces of hell or the abyss. You could be rulers of a country. I've done this twice and uh, some of the best campaigns I've ever done in my entire life. Grab a copy of Birthright, which is an old D&D second edition book. Really, really good. Bit old fashioned now. But it's a good primer for what they call domain level play, which is uh, a part of the campaign where you're simply just making decisions um, that that are not personal. They're not on an individual level. They're for your country. They're for your county. They're for your whatever region of land you own is called. You play that. Echo Resounding by Kev Crawford. That dude is the man. Grab that. That's a really, really good book. Pendragon has domain level play. <sighs> I actually think I might do a, a video later on on domain level play. It's really fun. You'll be dealing with rival states. You'll be carefully overseeing farming, mining, logging, fishing, secondary industries as well. You'll be negotiating trade with other countries. You'll be enforcing laws. You'll be keeping, because you don't want to do too much in the way of war or anything. So you're going to want to um, keep peace talks open at all times. You're going to want to keep peace talks open uh, between other countries that you already deal with and their fighters so that you are a third neutral party you're, you're maybe you're a Casablanca type place you're a small kingdom where all around you is wars but you are the one place that everyone can you know you're you're a sort of um, what do they call it oh, Casablanca so Belgium there you go you will probably want to have some of your PCs be uh, either non-nobles or from cadet houses because just lesser ranking people. <clears throat> rulers of a country. I've done a few campaigns with rulers of a country and what they call domain level play, which is that when at least a part of your campaign represents decisions, decisions made not for your PCs, but for your realm, your nation, your kingdom, your duchy, whatever. Um, domain level play is very, very cool. I'll probably do a video on it. I really, really like it. Uh, some games that uh, already have domain level play include Kev Crawford, who's a really, really great games designer working in OSR spaces at the moment, and Echo Resounding, great book. Uh, what's it called? Birthright. Birthright, which is a second edition book. Um, 
it's good you should you should have a look at it um, I don't really like the world I think it's a bit ordinary but the actual domain level play is, is quite interesting especially the magic that you can do you will be dealing with rival states you'll be trying to keep things peaceful you might be working as um, neutral spaces between other warring parties so that you're always having guys coming into your kingdom and saying right you need to help us make peace or you need to help us make war you will be looking after your various kinds of industry your logging your fishing your mining your farming all of that stuff you will be wanting to keep that uh up and running and going there will be uh, demand level play has a lot of um give and take uh, resource management so you'll want to have a lot of discussions with the party about what you think is good do we plant this year do we the um do we open up the mine even though we know that the mine is haunted do we you know, all that sort of business uh, it's very very cool not all your players need to be actually in the nobility so you might have a general you might have a pope you might have a lesser cadet staff or cadet member you might have a member of a cadet house which is a just a house that you sponsor or is from the third son of a third son rather than a, an actual in the line of inheritance they will tend to have a bit more social freedom, so they might be spy masters or actually going out and having little side adventures. You could be criminals. Complex Ocean's Eleven style scams and schemes. You can do a crime without making it a violent crime. And any kind of big heist film should show you how little violence needs to play into these kinds of adventures. The juice there is in, you know, you do up some really, really cool maps for the players. You let them scheme. You let them assemble. You let them hire specialists. You let them, you know, you start in the, in the beginning of play. You might allow your um, various party members to have, say, I know a fence. I know a professional burglar. I know a drug dealer. I know a guy who can turn invisible. I know, you know, a few contacts so that they can then assemble pretty uh, elite crews give them each of them a rival a cop who they don't like or, or a rival they've crossed in business and this is where a game like leverage comes in actually quite handily because they have mechanics ready to make things like to make adventures like this go sideways and to introduce tangles which is what you want in a crime drama you could be cops too um, not all cops are, are, are shooting out with everyone every session um, you are going to be solving daring heists, preventing daring heists. You are going to be dealing with how did her jewels leave in the middle of day when everyone could see that she was already wearing them. Oh no, it turns out it was a doppelganger. Oh no, there's a beholder crime lord living in the sewers. Oh no, there's a werewolf hunting. Loads and loads of stuff to do. Um, they just... And even then, even then, the arrest doesn't have to be a violent shakedown. Shakedown. You don't have to stab the dude to death to arrest him. You know, um, just I'm sure you've watched a police show before. Just I don't know. Just watch the bill or something. You know, there's there's loads and loads of shows that deal with enforcing laws that do not deal with violence. So, yeah. So. You could be a traveling circus, uh, carnival style inspirations, or um, Genevieve Valentine. She wrote a book called Mechanique, which had a fantasy circus, which I quite liked. Lots of interesting NPCs there. Um, lots of drama as well. You could have a cruel pit boss. You might have a um, very. They probably not get in trouble for saying this, but now the freak show. You know the 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 beardless dwarf, the guy who kills octopuses and glues them to his face and pretends to be, I am the friendly Illithid. I can read your mind. You're afraid, you know? Um, uh, look, it's a blink dog, which is just a German shepherd you've painted yellow. Lots of fun. Lots of fun to be had. Um, maybe even a sports team. Maybe you're a fantasy sports team. Like... I don't know anything about sport, but maybe you do, so maybe you can be in a fantasy crime sports. I don't know. Right. Play characters. Play classes. Okay. Um, this is one of the big reasons why I suggest that D&D might not be the best way for this to go. Because what are you going to do with a barbarian? What are you going to do with a paladin or a fighter or even a ranger? 
Not all classes are going to contribute evenly to all games. Be frank with it. Be upfront with it. Talk to your players about it. Most of them, a lot of players come in with, I have a favorite character class. I like to play rangers. And what are you going to do if you're a diplomatic core and you're a ranger and you're literally never leaving the house? You're never leaving parties and, and banks. So have chats about that. Just be upfront about it. You'll be okay. Um, and a lot of the time with uh, games like this, just feel free to let people re-roll. Friction, not conflict, is what you're going for. Have a extensive first session where it's all about finding ties between the players, finding ties to the world, giving them lots of reasons to agree, to disagree, small alliances within the PC group, small uh, loyalties to things outside the PCs. So you might belong to a noble family while being an ambassador, which means that eventually the the noble family are going to say to you, is there a way for us to wet our beak because of what you're doing? Can we ad- advantage, take advantage of your position, even though it might make you look bad in the eyes of the king? Things like that. Um, an, an, an artist who maybe is a warlock and whose patron is saying to them, no, change things. Make them in my glory, not the glory of the god. Yeah. Loyalties and division of loyalties are all the exciting stuff that will make a game that doesn't have violence because we really are going to have to, in a D&D game, do a lot of work. Find an adventure generator, find something, sit down and really make a lot of notes about things that can happen, when they can happen. Talk to your players about things that they might want to happen to their characters so that you can bring them into your campaign. It's a lot of work, but I reckon if you are willing to do it and if you want to have um, a lot of role playing, if you're happy to have a lot of role playing, if you're happy to play a lot of NPCs, and if you're happen, happy to just let your players decide what they want to occur in the game rather than you providing plots, plots, plots over and over, they are providing plots and plots and plots to you, you'll have a good Pacific campaign. I think that you will enjoy yourself. Have a good one. This is YouTube. You know what to do. Like, subscribes, the things. I don't really know anything. I'm Christian. This is Crowland Publishing. See you next time.